All right. Welcome. Thank you all for coming and sitting up. Steve, thousand bonus points for having you come up to the front. Uh, great to see everybody. My name is Ty Sigley. I'm the executive director of Common Ground. And could everybody please silence their cell phones if you haven't already done that. And I want to thank Ham Votes, which was here registering people to vote before the event. Shout out to Ham Votes. Uh, that's good. All right. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our final Common Ground event for the year. Over the course of the past year, uh, academic year, we have held 10 events. Our speakers have engaged with students in class, at dinner, in the chapel, at the events barn, all over the place. Our mission is to explore cross-boundary political thought and complex social issues. Common Ground brings highly respected thought leaders, like the ones we have tonight, to the Hamilton campus to participate in small classroom dialogues, which both of our uh, panelists have done today, and large event discussions. Topics are intertwined with the college's curriculum and are chosen to foster critical thinking and holistic examination of difficult and often contentious national and global policy issues. And that's what we're gonna do tonight with our topic, State of the Race, Biden versus Trump and the Road to the White House. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to host this event with our partner, the Bipartisan Policy Center, a Washington-based not-for-profit that ensures policymakers work across party lines to craft bipartisan solutions. BPC says that bipartisanship is not about abandoning your party. Likewise, Common Ground does not try to change your position on an issue. Instead, we want to bring people together to learn about complex issues and highlight differences in a civil way. I want to thank our Common Ground team, Assistant Director Katie Stewart, uh, Program Assistant, yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Program Assistant Kim Ritchie. And our student ambassadors, and could our student ambassadors please raise their hand? There they are over here, yay. In fact, uh, our ambassador just returned from a fantastic trip to Washington, D.C., and they met experts at the Bipartisan Policy Center, toured the Capitol, thanks to Hamilton alum and Congressman Matt Cartwright. Uh, uh, it was a great trip. The college is also grateful to Mary Helen and Rob Morris, Eve Niquette and Charles Pohl, Lori and David Hess, their support is indispensable. And a shout out to Rob and Mary Helen, who uh, I visited yesterday in Connecticut. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Steve Scully. Steve is the Senior Vice President for Communications at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, he hosts a serious XM show, The Briefing, on POTUS Politics channel. And today, he hosted his show right here on campus, uh, interviewing students and faculty. Steve has interviewed every president since Gerald Ford. I think that's nine? Ten. Ten. Michael, Douglas. Michael Douglas. Oh, shout out to the movie president. Very well done. Nine presidents. In his three-decade career at C-SPAN, he has served as political editor, host, and senior executive producer of C-SPAN's programming, including the Washington Journal, Road to the White House series, and its podcast, The Weekly. Steve served nine years on the White House Correspondents Association, including a year as its president. In 2019, he was named to the Pennsylvania Broadcasters Hall of Fame. And Steve was instrumental in starting the Hamilton Bipartisan Policy Center Partnership. And I'm so pleased to have him here this evening. So please join me in welcoming our moderator, Steve Scully. Thank you all for being with us. And, and I thought as a way of introduction, the best way to do that is to have both John and Aaliyah tell their story because they come to the table with different experiences. John is a almost lifelong Republican. Lifelong. Aaliyah, lifelong. <laughs> Aaliyah, a, an active Democrat. And so we really do hope to engage. We'll be talking policy and politics and Biden versus Trump, the race that everyone is excited about, right? <laughs> uh, so Aaliyah, let me begin with you because you grew up in a large family like me in Western Pennsylvania, and you got involved in politics very early. I did. Uh, grew up in a small town in Western Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Pittsburgh. It's called Newcastle. It's your quintessential Rust Belt town that was thriving uh, up until the 80s when, you know, most places saw that industry collapse. Uh, it, you know, I, when I was growing up, I come from a single parent household. I'm the first in my family to go to college. I could not wait to, to get out of that town. Um, 
So I um, did go to college. I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I've had so many conversations today here with students who are these amazing students who've been able to be so articulate about what they wanted to do. That that was not me. Uh, I was a political science major just because my family was a union family and uh, it was something that was familiar to me. And um, I definitely knew I wanted to make some sort of change, but that was really as far as I got. So my junior year uh, of college, I needed an internship, honestly, just to, to graduate. So I went on the College Dems website and I applied to every available internship and I got a call back from one of them that was undisclosed Democrat in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, they gave me an address and I showed up and it ended up being for, um, at the time, Dan Honorado, who was the Allegheny County Executive in, in Pittsburgh. He was gearing up for a run for governor. Um, and they they hired me. And honestly, that that really changed my life. I was so excited to go to work every day. I did everything from stuffing envelopes to uh, helping staff fundraisers to just really anything the campaign needed done. And then they decided to hire me my senior year. Um, so I was going to school full time and, and working on a campaign full time, which great experience wouldn't change it. I don't really recommend it if you don't have to do it. Um, and I still talk to those people to this day. They've become my greatest friends in politics. They've become my greatest connections in politics. Um, that has kind of catapulted into one job after another. I worked for Planned Parenthood in Pennsylvania for three years. I was their political director, um, their lobbyist, their communications director. I worked for Next Gen America, which was Tom Steyer's organization. Um, we organized college campuses. Um, I, I worked with them both in the 2016 and the 2018 election. Um, and then from there, I went on to work for Better O'Rourke in Texas. I was his national press secretary. I worked for Governor DePaul, Deval Patrick. And then it all comes full circle because in 2020, all eyes were on Pennsylvania. It was the pandemic. I had moved uh, back home to be with my family and I ran Pennsylvania from my mom's house in, in Newcastle from her, her spare bedroom. Um, went on to to work in the White House, where Pennsylvania was also still part of my portfolio. So, you know, the little town that I once thought I wanted to get out of has really become my career. And one final quick note, because what is so remarkable for the students here at Hamilton, Democrat or Republican, if you want to move up quickly, work on a campaign. I mean, is that so true? It's so true. You know, campaigns, uh, Jenna Miley Dillon will, will say... Who, who of course uh, ran Biden's campaign in 2020 and is advising in, in 2024, will tell you that you, you have two resources on a campaign. One is time, one is money. And if you are working hard and you can help those people maximize their time, you will rise up like, like no other. Um, and the connections you make are just unbeatable. You meet people who are donors, you meet people who are other elected officials. Um, and again, I, I actually, just just hired someone who I worked with on that 20 TED campaign. So when you meet people that you trust and you're loyal to, especially in politics, it's it's really unbeatable. John Fear, you come to the table with similar but very different experiences on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah, I'm a house guy. Um, I worked in the House of Representatives. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me here. This reminds me of the set of the Gilmore Girls. Um, I, still, I, I, st I still love it. Yeah. My daughter loves Gilmore Girls, so I just had to get that out there. Um, it's been uh, it's great to be here. First time to Hamilton College and uh, love this experience. Uh, yeah, I'm a house guy. I've spent my whole career in the house. When I was a junior in high school, we took a class trip. I lived I'm from the south side of Chicago. Uh, we Marquette, Marquette University Marquette graduate. University, yeah. And my junior year in high school, we took a, a class trip to uh, Washington, D.C. And as the, the plane was landing, I said to myself, I'm going to live in Washington, D.C. And I had no idea how I was going to do it. I had no idea... I really had no idea what the difference was between the House and the Senate. And um, I was not, you know, somebody who loved the political game per se, but I love politics. I, and I love talking about politics. And my dad uh, and I and my brothers would uh, watch the Capitol gang. I, you know, I can make these references because we have older people here, which is great. Uh, and the McLaughlin group. And I'd sit around and I'd watch these TV shows and I said, I want to be that guy. I want to argue politics. And it was back when Reagan was president. And I want to go work for Ronald Reagan because I loved Ronald Reagan. That's where I became a lifelong Republican from that perspective. I um, have, and I've said this joke many times to all my classes, I went to Marquette. I got a master's degree in British and Irish history, which is a good way to take a vow of poverty. Um, 
I'm sorry to the history professor there, but that's that's all true. Um, and and from that perspective, I couldn't figure out whether I was going to get my law degree or uh, get my PhD in history. I was accepted to Notre Dame Law School, accepted to uh, Wisconsin PhD program in Northwestern, but I couldn't figure out how to pay for it because I didn't have any money. And my dad said after after my four years at Marquette, you're out, you're out. Go find somewhere to live. Get the heck out of here. I'm, I'm you're cutting, you're cut off. So. I came up with a scheme to move to Washington and ended up working for a guy named Bob Michael. Bob Michael was the longest serving House minority leader in history through just a variety of ways. I, 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 I became an intern for him. And what I, what I became exceptional at was fixing the copy machine. And I learned the value of being indispensable. And what was indispensable at that time, back in the late 80s, early 90s, was hiring to unjam the paper and the facts and, and the copy machine. Now, I couldn't do that today. I can't do anything technology-wise, but I was desperate to get a job. After a while, Bob Michael became a mentor to me, but he also liked the, how I wrote, uh, liked the fact that I could put, string a sentence together. And I, and I was you know, someone who was a passionate Republican conservative. Uh, after I, I, when, once Bob retired, I moved back to Illinois in the hopes that someday I would run for office. Uh, that never happened because the Republicans captured the House for the first time in 40 years. I was asked to come back, and I met this guy named Tom DeLay, the hammer, who was the whip. And I learned a lot about politics from Tom DeLay. Some of the older folks remember that. Younger people have no idea what Tom DeLay is, which is probably a good thing. Uh, I left DeLay's office when he impeached Bill Clinton. I felt that impeaching Bill Clinton was not the best idea. Um, and then I went, to, uh, I went to work for a lobby firm. Uh, Denny Hastert, uh, through a, a variety of crazy coincidences and scandals, because if you recall, we were impeaching Bill Clinton because he was having sex with an intern, which would be an impeachable, which would be a fireable offense in corporate America today and should have been back then, but wasn't because his popularity range were 70%. Uh, for a variety of ways, uh, Newt Gingrich also was having an affair, as was Bob Livingston, and they figured the only guy that wasn't having an affair was Denny Hastert, which turned out to be true, although later it was revealed he had some other issues that, you know, you can read the newspapers about. <laughs> Uh, so I ended up. We becoming, won't go there. We won't go there. I ended up becoming Den Denny Hastert's spokesman for six and a half years. I broke Chris Matthews' record with six years. He was the uh, speaker's uh, speaker O'Neill's um, uh, press secretary. I figured out what his record was and, and beat that. And then Chris and I ended up becoming pretty good friends. And I would appear on his show once I left left Congress. I would say that one of the things that I most enjoyed once I left Congress and once I was able to kind of become a pundit is the opportunity to actually do the uh, Capital Gang on CNN. And I, 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 for me, it was kind of full circle. I, for your old folks who remember those TV shows, there was a period where cable TV was a great place where Republicans and Democrats could have huge arguments and show that they were also enjoying each other's company. And that and Ca Capital Gang and McLaughlin Group were those places you could do that. And I, I got a chance to be one of those guys. And I had a, a great time uh, going on a lot of cable TV shows. I One of my most fun experiences was doing Bill Maher's show for four, four times. And I know that this probably skews a little bit left, but I did Bill Maher's show right after Bernie Sanders did was on. And I could tell you, they love Bernie Sanders a lot more than they love me. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm delighted to be here and hopefully I can share some thoughts on, on this crazy political season that we're ready to encounter. So issue one, <laughs> to paraphrase John McLaughlin, abortion. Let's get right into it, because this is there are, in my mind, three driving issues in this campaign, abortion, the economy and immigration, everything else, age and Biden and all that we'll get to. But how significant is it that you have in this post Dobbs world what happened in Arizona now making it illegal? A law that was put in place in 1864. Arizona became a state in 1912. Do the math. You have the referendum in Florida. Some people say Florida might be on uh, in contention for the Democrats. I doubt that, but perhaps. But just how big of an issue is this for the Democrats? I think it's the issue for the Democrats. I think when we are talking about abortion, we we are winning. Um, I think we've had example after example after example. Um, even since 2020, there was Kansas, there was Kentucky, there was Ohio. Uh, I think I'm, I'm a little biased because I've you know done work in the reproductive rights space basically my entire career and continue to. I think one of, if not the biggest reason that 2022 was not a blowout in the midterms for Democrats was because abortion was on the ballot. Um, so I, I think it, it is the issue. I think, you know, the vice president is out there talking about it as much as she can. I think Biden came out with a very powerful statement 
as soon as the Arizona decision came down, I think they're going to continue talking about it. Um, I think, you know, it, I think a lot of the time people think that it's just a suburban women issue. It turns out then that's not true. It's black women, it's Latino women, it's young women, it's some young men, it's men in general. It's something that Americans have shown time and time again that they're deeply, deeply concerned about. Um, and Trump's record could not have been more clear. Uh, he, you know, takes full responsibility for the Supreme Court justices that have uh, come around since he was elected. Um, it's the, you know, the Republicans have had this plan for, for years and years and years. This has been their North Star to get to this point. It's why when uh, Hillary lost in 2016, you know, so many of us were devastated and gutted because we knew that this moment was was coming. And, you know, it took a few years. So it's here. And it's here. OK, so you mentioned Ronald Reagan. He was a big proponent of right to life. You had George H.W. Bush. You had George W. Bush. Donald Trump gives you your party exactly what your party had been talking about in the Roe v. Wade world. Steve, let, let me just remind me, I, I'm not going to invite you to my, my next Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> uh, listen, um, I've written about this. I, if you look, go to my Substack page, I have a whole column about this. Uh, this is the big Achilles heel for Republicans. And there's, there's no doubt about it. I, I'm extremely frustrated. The Republicans haven't come up with a coherent plan post Dobbs because your point is right. They, this is something that, from the rights perspective, they've been pushing for this at all uh, for for a while. I think that's the proverbial tiger that caught its own tail, or the dog that caught the car, or whatever crazy cliche you want to use. Don't wish for what, what you want. Well, I mean, and I, I, I honestly, you can see how how powerful this is as an issue mm -hmm. because Trump is trying to change his his feelings on this. He now wants this to be a states states rights issue which I think politically is fraught for Republicans. because John, what, what, it's like Swiss cheese. I mean, his, he is all over the place. Well, I, think he's, I think it's strategic ambiguity on his part. I think he's trying to confuse where he really is because I think he's actually confused where he really is. And I think that he knows, and he's been the one guy in, in, the, in the party from the leadership perspective who's been warning that this is going to hurt us. I think the thing about Trump, say what you will about Trump, but he has a very good appreciation of where the politics are. And he knows, and this is why he came out with that statement yesterday on this, because he knows that politically, this is the one thing that could kill Republicans. And we know that it could kill Republicans because um, it has in the last, since Dobbs, they've lost almost every election. They should have won 15 more seats. Now, this is not the only issue of the campaign. I mean, inflation, I think, is a, is a bigger issue. I think that uh, uh, immigration is a bigger issue. I think lack of uh, presidential leadership uh, it, it internationally is a big issue uh, that, that a lot of voters care about. But for a specific group of voters who are going to come out and could be decisive in the election, it, it could be devastating for Republicans unless they get their act together. And I don't think sufficiently moving it back to the states is good. And I'll tell you why. And that is because you have every state has different uh, borders, obviously, but they all have a, the common media market. And so if you have a a uh, state, Alabama make something, we saw this with IVF. You, you have Alabama make some dramatic statement on abortion or Arizona and Florida, everyone thinks it's in their backyard. And so it's not sufficient to run back to the states. They, he has to have some bigger strategy that, that and whether that's um, the Lindsey Graham plan of some sort of, I'm gonna push for something that's, you know, partial birth abortion is, mm -hmm. is illegal, but everything else is legal. And with uh, rape, rape, uh, incest, and, and, and all uh, incest, incest, and uh, life of the mother and ex exemptions, there's a way you can strategically do that. But that's not where the Republicans are now. It's, for them, it's a complete mess. So, Aaliyah, inflation and the economy, the border, bigger issues, as John was saying. I think they're all big issues. I think abortion is the issue where it is clear cut. The, you know what the Republicans stand for. They've shown us time and time and time again, it is a yes or no question. Do you support reproductive freedom for women? Yes or no? And the answer is overwhelmingly from the Republican Party, no. I think inflation, a bit more complicated. I think the border, a bit more complicated on, on both sides. I think abortion is the strongest, most clear-cut example uh, of where the two candidates differ. John, this is the race that nobody wants. 70% of Americans, Wall Street Journal, NBC News, Bloomberg poll, they don't want Trump versus Biden. How did we end up with this? You have two incumbents. Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to beat Joe Biden because he was the incumbent. And 
the Democrats viewed any challenge to Biden as as weakening uh, weakening Biden because most if you have a big significant challenge to incumbent, it tends to lead to their their loss. And I think Republicans view Trump as the incumbent. They 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 view him, and it's very rare. It actually, it's only happened one other time, where well, two other times. Where well, Kai was there for the Grover Cleveland election, right? But <laughs> Otherwise, he told me about Grover Cleveland. He said Grover was a pretty good guy, <laughs> right? A little bit misunderstood. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think the Republican base, the overwhelming majority of Republicans felt that Trump deserved another shot. And that's what the polls showed. And so why does he deserve it? I mean, if you think about well, Donald he Trump, deserves it because he got the most votes and he's right. But I mean, you look at his presidency, the highest turnover of any modern presidency you had everything from the Access Hollywood video before the election to two impeachments to January 6th. And yet he still has a firm grip on the party that is Donald Trump's party. How did we get there? Uh, well, I think that he was able to speak to the economics and insecurities of the, the voter in the middle of America. And I think he did that and he messaged that in ways and not just economic insecurities, kind of insecurities about where we are in this world the forgotten middle class, the working class. And I think he's done a, he did a very effective job. And I think people look back on his years before COVID and they they viewed him as someone who delivered the goods, that they, they had a, a strong economy. They felt good about the economy and they felt good about America. And they felt good about, this is from the Republican standpoint, not mm -hmm. from the, the Democrat standpoint, but the Republicans felt very good about about his presidency. And the the funny thing is that the Republican base overlooks Trump's implication in COVID. And this was, the interesting thing is that Ron DeSantis kind of ran as the person who was against the COVID shutdowns. And that had no traction in the Republican primaries, which I was shocked by, because I, I supported DeSantis because of because uh, I thought uh, Trump misplayed COVID. Um, but, you know, uh, they, they see those those years as, the years when America was stronger and the economy was stronger, and they they felt that they had a anti-establishment voice that was looking out for their interests, and they still feel it. So let me put what is a very plausible scenario. Again, a lot can change. It's early mid-April, but let's assume if the polls are right, that the Democrats pick up the House of Representatives, that the Republicans regain the U.S. Senate, that Donald Trump is elected president, that Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas retire allowing a Republican Senate and a Republican president to have two other justices, conservatives, but presumably justices in their 40s or early 50s. I mean, that I think is one of the strongest messages for Democrats in this campaign, right? Um, I, I hear a lot of people, and to your point, people might not be excited about Biden and they might not be excited about Trump. Um, if those are the choices, these are the arguments you have to make, right? Like that, that is a motivating argument for me. I think we've seen what happens when we don't think about the Supreme Court, when we don't think about our institutions as a whole, when we don't think about democratic norms. Um, I think we need to be out there every single day making that argument. I think that is a scary, scary prospect for the future of the country. So at dinner tonight, and Josh was saying, you know, with Donald Trump, we understood with foreign policy where America stood. We were stronger and better under Donald Trump than we are under Joe Biden. Your response is what? On foreign policy. On foreign policy. I think we're living in a totally different time. Um, I think we've seen, you know, Ukraine and Russia come up. I think we saw Afghanistan happen right, you know, in mid-2021 after he took it. I think now we're in the middle of Israel and Gaza, which is, has been horrific. I think it's come one after the other after the other. I know when I go to bed at night, um, when, when it comes down to foreign policy, what I care about is, is temperament of, of the person in charge. And for me, that better choice is, is Joe Biden. Listen, I think, I think that one of the great things about Trump was he was so unpredictable that the sense was internationally that they weren't gonna screw with America because they weren't quite sure what the hell he was gonna do. And I think, I mean, he was different from the typical foreign policy establishment. He certainly was a rejection of George Bush and and in all institutions and all and 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 the foreign policy institutions. But he also he was a someone who would had the courage to go uh, meet with uh, uh, with North Korea's dictator, and in a sense that he would do anything to avoid war. But he also was so um, he projected strength. He project, and I think that that's what certainly where Republicans are. Republican the Democrats and a lot of foreign policy Republicans didn't like that unpredictability. 
And that's why you, you have a hard time going to sleep at night. But for a lot of Republicans, they liked the strength. They liked the fact that he projected strength. And they were not at all upset that the Europeans didn't like him very much, much like when Republicans liked Ronald Reagan. The Europeans hated Ronald Reagan as well. So listen, I think that um, this is going to be one of the debates. But I do think that Trump's strength and unpredictability is something that the Republicans like. George Bush told me once that second terms are awful. And they have been awful for Richard Nixon and you look at Barack Obama, you look at Iran-Contra with uh, with Reagan, you look at the impeachment of Bill Clinton. If Biden is reelected, what is his second term going to look like? Well, I, I think it's going to look a lot like what we've had. Um, if if um, you'll have a Republican Senate, I, I, don't, I think you'll have a lot of nothing happen. I think you'll have a lot. Well, that's of, encouraging. I think, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I, I think that you will have, um, I think you also, Biden is going to be, deteriorating. He's very already very old. And so people are going to be wondering who's, who's going to be the next president. And almost immediately, once uh, by, by, if Biden gets reelected, which I don't think he will, but if he does, there's going to be an immediate effort to figure out who's going to be the next president on the Democratic side, whether it's Kamala Harris or who it's going to be. And, you know, I think people are wondering how long he can last. Why has Kamala Harris been such a lightning rod? Because you look at the history of vice presidents from Walter Mondale and Dan Quayle, and it's inherent in the, in the job, you know, is uh, Jim Nance Gardner said, is it J James Nance Gardner? James Nance Gardner. Worth a warm bucket of spit, although some people say it wasn't the spit that he was referring to, but, but she's had a tougher trajectory. Why? I think that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think there's some, some obvious things there. She's the first woman to ever hold vice president or, or president, and a lot of people don't like that. She's also a black woman. Uh, I, I think we knew it would be tougher for her than it would be for a lot of other candidates all along, but I think that's also why she was the, the quintessential perfect pick for, for 2020. I think we've seen her be super strong on a lot of controversial issues, and that makes people uncomfortable. You know, she's out there talking about abortion. She's been out there talking about race. She's She's kind of taken some of those Thornier, thorn, thornier issues, and and that's tough. And you know, I, I will say to to your point about a second Biden Harris term, they they have gotten a lot done. We've we've gotten progress on climate. We've gotten 15 million jobs. Um, the first gun legislation passed in I don't know how many years. Uh, insulin capped at 35. dollars If that is what a second term of Biden Harris looks like, I I think that's a pretty good future for the country. So John, Donald Trump wins this election because what? Well, I listen, I think that people are going to look at both records and I think they're going to say, you know what, I want the return of Trump to get better economy. Get, I think inflation is, is going to really hurt uh, Biden. I think the fact that everything is so expensive and we all know how expensive things are. And they think that Trump, I mean, if you, and if you look at the polls, uh, when it comes to inflation, Trump is really killing Biden. If you look at immigration, Trump is killing um, Biden. If you look at crime control, Trump is killing Biden. All these specific issues outside of abortion, uh, if those are the issues that become preeminent, and I think they will become preeminent, uh, I think that if you look at the, the swing states and, and uh, he's got a, he's up in most of those polls in the swing states, uh, there's about six or seven states that really matter. He seems to be pulling well in all those states. And I do think that he will do better uh, amongst the white working class, but I think he'll also do better amongst the, the black working class and uh, Hispanic working class than, than any president has done since a Republican president has done since uh, Nixon. Uh, and uh, I think that will give him the margin of error. And it's, it's and I think that the weakness of the, of the Biden administration on the international stage, and also just the fact that he's just unsteady. Um, I think that, that that's why if Trump wins, that's what will be the reasons. But here's what I am trying to wrap my head around, because you have his very loyal vice president, Mike Pence, who will not support Donald Trump. You have Liz Cheney, you talk about Republican establishment is fearful of a Trump presidency. You have George W. Bush, who will go nowhere near Donald Trump. You have all of his Republican opponents, Chris Christie, not all, but many, Chris Christie, Nikki Haley, they're not endorsing Donald Trump. So what does that tell you about a Trump presidency and where the guardrails will or will not be in 2025? Well, I think the Constitution is the guardrails, and I think that you'll have the institutions, the Supreme Court, and the Congress act as guardrails. And uh, Listen, I think that Trump is running as a rejection of the political establishment, and I think people don't like the political establishment. I also think that people didn't like George Bush. 
When he left, he was the most unpopular president in history, and for good reason. The Iraq war was a complete disaster. The financial crisis was a complete disaster. And, you know, he left, he barely got out of town. The reason why he's popular now is because he's best friends with Barack Obama. Um, and, you know, that's, I like Bush. I supported him. But, you know, at the end, I was sick of Bush. And so R Trump ran against his brother, Bush's brother, and went to South Carolina and said the Iraq war was the wrong thing to do in South Carolina, which is home to, I don't know how many military bases, but a lot of them. And he won over South Carolina overwhelmingly. So Trump ran as a rejection for Bush and a rejection of the political establishment. So it should be no real surprise that Liz Cheney, George Bush, and all the people who were part of that political establishment really don't like him. So I'm not, you're not here to uh, defend the age of Joe Biden, but it is an issue in this campaign. You were asked about it earlier today. He is at 82 in November. He'll be 86 if he survives four years in the White House during his second term. And Ali, he ran as a trans transitional candidate. Many people thinking he would serve one term and then move on. Why a second term? Why not somebody else? Why not turn the page? for a younger Democrat, whether that's Kamala Harris or Gavin Newsom or Governor Shapiro or Governor Moore or Governor Whitmer, any of those who would have been viable candidates? I think it's a fair question. And I think it is one of the you know biggest questions. It's what you hear. It's what I heard all day today when we were, were talking to students. But look, I think there's there's two points. I think when people talk about age, there's there's two issues. One is just mental acuity and fitness for the job. I think Biden has proven over and over and over again that he he he's there. He you know might slip up a word, he might walk a little slower, but his mental fitness is is there for the job. Second is I think a lot of young people, and I've worked with young people for most of my career, both with Planned Parenthood and Next Gen, and you know on on various campaigns. Um, it, it's hard for them to see themselves in an eighty one year old candidate. I I think that's fair. Uh, but again, we these are the choices we have. They're they're both pretty old. I will say. To, to the second part of your question, he's the candidate because nobody else stepped up. You know, Gavin Newsom talked about it. He he didn't pull the trigger and, and run. I also think, you know, we had, Democrats had uh, a better than expected mission. And I think when that happened, uh, people did rally around Biden and, and, you know, thought he was the best person to take on Trump again. And they would have had the majority had it not been for New York State. Yeah, I would, also, I would also say, you know, what... Biden gave a very spirited State of the Union. Trump said he was on cocaine. Well, he, I, I don't know. I, I, well, he I, might have been. I don't know. I, I doubt it very seriously. But whatever he was on, cocaine is well, whatever he was on, I don't think Biden does cocaine. Um, but those are his words, not mine. I'm just telling you what I mean. He was on who he, mean, he, had, he was on cocaine. I, I would stay away from cocaine myself, but that's a different story. Uh, listen, but he gave a spirited State of the Union and that there was no way they're going to replace him after that State of the Union. Now, I think he's old. I think he's can barely function. Um, I, I, every, every time I watch him, I wonder what he's going to say next. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he's the incumbent. There was no way, to Leah's point, he, he ran as the anti-Trump. 1988, he ran. 2008, well, he, he wanted to run in 2016. He finally ran in 2020. Between Trump and Biden, seven campaigns for the presidency. I mean, the, the irony is that when he ran in 2020, he was the only guy that could beat Trump. And now in 2024, he might be the only guy that could lose to Trump. But but, he, but here's the thing, John. So if if the Republicans, I know it's Donald Trump's party, but just bear with me for a minute. If they had nominated a Nikki Haley, I think we'd be sitting here talking about the next female president because he she would have, if you look at every metric, would have easily beaten Joe Biden. That's not how politics works, Steve. <laughs> I mean, I had my dream candidate. It wasn't it wasn't Donald Trump or Nikki Haley. Um, it was you. It wasn't me, although I'd be an excellent president. <laughs> uh, it, it was Ron DeSantis, and he had no personality, and he was kind of a dud. You know, you run the campaign that you're you're just presented with, and we got the candidates that we've got, and that's the system. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, you're stuck with him, and we're stuck with Trump. So, you know, you got to make the best of it. Hey, Ali, just spend a minute to talk about grassroots tactics, because John and I were talking earlier, and you really have been immersed in this, and for young people getting involved in politics today, it is so different than those who might remember politics from the 70s and 80s. Just give us a sense of how it works and why it's so successful. Well, a, a few things. I think, number one, nothing replaces a face-to-face -face conversation, right? Like, to be completely transparent, I thought maybe John and I were going to get here today and we were going to hate each other and, you know, fight on everything. I like you. We had a great day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're with someone... They like person, each other. Yeah, right. uh, Mikey! She's from an Irish-Italian-Catholic family. What's not to like? Right. <laughs> 
yeah, when you're when you're with somebody, there's nothing that replaces the camaraderie of looking at a person face to face, finding common ground to to use the the phrase of the night, and and having a real conversation, right? I think um, to to knock on my own party a, a a tiny tiny bit, one of the things I've been uh, most pushy about is when I have conversations with other more senior people in the party is I'm someone who's kept in touch with my my big family and my friends in, in Newcastle. Um, and I do have an ear to the ground and listen to, you know, what issues actually affect them and that, you know, they're hearing, I think a good example is numbers on inflations, but it's not matching up with what they're they're feeling on the ground. And nothing replaces that that personal story. Um, as far as tactically things go, I think there was this this notion up until now that there were two subsets of, of voters, right? And I don't know, the Republicans do it the same way. Wait, I'm sure they do. You have your base voters who are basically going to turn out for Democrats no matter what. They just need a nudge. Hey, election day is November 7th. Here's your polling place. Show up. You know it's a vote for them. Then you have your swing and your persuasion voters. Those are people who are maybe open to it, but you have, you have to have more uh, in-depth conversations, listen, you know, and, and really win them over. I think where we're at in this moment is what I think everybody's a persuasion voter. I don't think we can take any turnout voter for granted. I don't think we can persuasion say- Persuasion not base. Yeah, I don't think we can say that every black voter in Philadelphia is gonna show up for a Democrat anymore. I don't think that's enough. I think we need to be having those face-to-face -face conversations with them, whether you know that was traditionally a base, uh, you know, Pittsburgh city proper is traditionally a base. I think persuasion from here on out is name of the game. I think every voter, no matter what you know demographic or coalition they're a part of, is up for grabs, and we need to be out there talking. To them. And if Kim, keep in mind, Aaliyah is a master when it comes to what she does on on, on getting the base out, but also making personal connections with people because she's based on the, in the labor movement. And the labor movement, we've always kind of, from our perspective, the grassroots is something we always loved about the party and wish we could do it because you have a long tradition of having the union turn out the votes and 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 that is not easy to do it takes a lot it takes a lot more work than doing campaign commercials mm -hmm. and i think one of the things that is terrible about the body politic right now is how much money we spend on campaign commercials because it makes the uh the the, the consultant the media consultants very wealthy and worse i have to watch those damn commercials all the time which and they drive me crazy. Maybe you guys don't have them up here, but they're also terrible. They're dehumanizing. And the way that they go after each side, on both sides, they make it almost impossible for you to understand that this person is actually a real person that is actually trying to do good for, from their perspective and that you should respect them. And I think that's one of the reasons why Congress's ratings are so low because they spend so much time in such nasty campaign commercials. And I, I just want to say, what you do at the grassroots is awesome. And this is common ground, but it, it's clear you're voting Republican, you're voting Democrat. So where's the biggest disagreement between the two of you? Abortion. Abortion. So take that away. No. I mean, I mean we just have a, we have a fundamentally different view of it, and I respect your view. I, would, I, would, I have a fundamentally different view. There's no really reason for us to. I'm gonna talk. I'd be happy to talk about the politics of it, but I'm certainly not gonna get in an argument about it, because she has strongly held beliefs. I have strongly held beliefs, and there might be a common ground we can find there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as far as limitations, but I don't think she wants any limitations because I think she sees that as a slippery slope. And I, I want some because I, for, for reasons I want some. So what would those limitations look like? I think, you're gonna make me say this. I think it should be, I, th I, think, I think that having a um, 20 week, anything after 20 or 22 weeks, I think is very, very reasonable and protects fully formed babies. And um, you know, I think the science is there on that. And I think we should protect babies. That are over 22 weeks. I think that is fine for any woman to believe. I, I just think it should be up to, to the woman. I don't think we should have any limitations on what a woman chooses, especially when it comes to um, her health. I don't know if you all saw the Biden campaign ad that came out yesterday about the woman in Texas who had sepsis and couldn't figure out how to you know, terminate her pregnancy and was heartbroken. I think it is absolutely absurd that it is something that is in our, our laws. I think that is the most personal decision anyone can make and <clears throat> totally respect people who feel that way. And if that's bad for them, they, they should make that decision for themselves. So this is great because you respect each other's point of view and that's so important. John, as you know, Washington DC has become dysfunctional. It's become toxic. It's people on social media that can, can make false charges. It's people gravitating to either 
Fox News or One America News or MSNBC and reaffirming their own point of view rather than understanding the other point of view. I don't think that's Washington. I think that's America. Well, that's America too. So I mean, I, I think I think our, our problem. I mean, if you go to any to your point, you go back to any Thanksgiving dinner, and you're going to have the crazy aunt that believes this and the crazy uncle believes this, and they're both watching their different things and they can barely have a conversation. I think we have too much politics in this country. I think what we need to do is, you know, we need less politics and more just getting getting mm -hmm. along on 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 the basics of of, of living our lives and uh, having better, more richer communities. But that's that's just me. Can we get there? I doubt it. I mean, maybe we could. I mean, but we need a lot less cable television, a lot less media poking the bear all the time, and a lot more people getting out of their isolation and being in communities that are broader than their own, whether it's church organizations, uh, rotary, bowling leagues. Uh, I spent a lot of my time at Little League, or not Little League, not Little League, now it's, now it's high school baseball. Uh, yeah, his son's Duke. Baseball star, so congratulations. Yeah, and I'm hoping he plays in the major leagues because then he can I can pay for all this. He can pay me all the all the stuff that I all the little league stuff I've done for him. But he's he's not going to. Um so but you know, listen, I think that so Washington really reflects where where the, the American people these these people don't come in from outer space. They're all elected by you all. And they all come and they all hear from their different constituencies and they fight it out. Mm -hmm. Now some are better than others, and I think one of the biggest problems with Congress is that so few people have been in Congress for so few time, so little time, and they don't really understand the institutions. They don't understand what the rules are supposed to be. They don't understand how to do a conference committee. They don't understand how the rules committee is supposed to work. They don't understand the basics of legislating. And they all want to go on cable television because the incentive structure for politics is totally skewed away from making laws to making news. So is that why your party cannot keep a Speaker of the House? Well, we can't, we can't keep the Speaker of the House because we have a 218 vote majority. And Kevin McCarthy, to the abortion point, uh, thought he was going to get 230 votes and he had 224 votes. And uh, he really oversold how many uh, how big his wave was going to be. And we saw this in 1999 with Newt Gingrich. Everyone thought, Newt, Newt kept telling everyone that we, he was going to get 30 seats or 40 seats. And he got, we, we lost four seats. We just barely kept our majority. So the expectation game was there. And I think Kevin had some, you know, some toxic relationships with about six members uh, that did him in. And I think that, you know, Mike Johnson was the only guy they could find to do the job. And he's still learning. And, he, you know, being the Speaker of the House, I work for the Speaker of the House. It takes a lot of learning. And he has no majority. I mean, if they called to vacate the chair, uh, Hakeem Jeffries would have a halfway decent chance of being Speaker. And so, you know, that's kind of stupid. So we, not that we will, but potentially we could have had three speakers in eight months. Yeah, you know, sometimes that happens. I mean, Think about that for just a moment. Historically, that has happened. Um, yeah, back in uh, 1804. Yeah, I, but you know, no, I, 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 it's interesting because it, it's, it happened in the 1920s. Ty was not there in 1804, was just there, for the record. Ty was there in the 1920s. I know that Frederick drew Gillette after 13, uh, for 54 ballots, I think it was. Um, so, you know, what this happens when there's parties in transition. And I, I give you an interesting, one of the slimmest majorities we ever had was in 1932. And then uh, I think uh, the uh, Republicans had a one seat or two seat majority. And then F F uh, FDR became, got elected and they had a 300 vote majority. So you have these, these tussles, which the, depending on which side wins the argument, you can have these big wave elections. And so that could possibly happen and the stability uh, returns. Stability only really happens when you have big majorities. We're gonna to get to your questions. And I think we have two student uh, fellows, volunteers who will get to that. So if they get in place, we'll get to that in just a moment. John, I wanna stay with you for a minute because speculation already mounting, the VP selection, who's on the short list? And if you had to pick today on April the 10th, who do you think Trump selects? All right, so I'm going to tell you what I want. I want to run DeSantis. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Uh, I think it's going to be J.D. Vance. Uh, on the short list is probably Tim Scott. Uh, and um, I think from this region, Elise Stefanik is also uh, would be a good choice. She actually worked in the White House when she, uh, under the Bush administration, and Trump loves her. So those are kind of it, it, those are the, the different choices that are out there. But for some reason, I think it's going to be J.D. Vance. And a second Trump term with all that we've gone through, two impeachments, you know, Democrats regained the House of Representatives. What does that look like? It's going to be really exciting. Lots of lots of fun, <laughs> <laughs> lots of theater. Um, I think, you know, well, it depends on who wins the majority. I, I disagree with you on, on the House majority. I think if Biden 
uh, wins the presidency, I think the, the, the majority will be Democrat. If Trump wins the majority, I think the Rep Republicans will keep the majority. And if that happens, I think you'll have Republicans. So you're saying the Republicans have the House, the Senate, and the White House? Yeah, I think that I think that will do that. And I think what they'll spend a lot of their time on is trying to fix, uh, try to deal with this $3.7 trillion automatic tax increase that's that's coming if they don't deal with that in, in, by the end of 2025. And so there'll be a budget, budget and, and things like that. So in the last six months, the debt has gone up a trillion dollars. It was doubled under Barack Obama. It doubled under Donald Trump. How can you keep having tax cuts and a 34, 35, 36 trillion dollar debt that the young people here are going to inherit? Oh, well, and we talked about that in one of the classes. One of the biggest problems we're going to have is that we have to deal with our spending. We, we need entitlement reform. We need to figure out a way because where all that debt is coming from is entitlements, specifically Social Security and Medicare. I mean, that's what well, that's if, if you don't slow down the growth of spending, you're, you're going to we're going to go bankrupt. I think Social Security is going to go bankrupt by the end of uh, this decade, if not before and Medicare, the same thing. So you need to fundamentally change that. Now, neither Trump nor Biden want to do that. They both have both said but they have to. They, they don't have, have to, to do anything. What what they what they can do is they can inflate their way out, which is what's why inflation is so high. And really, the middle middle class and working class gets hit the hardest. They don't have to do anything. You know, if the American people tell them, "Don't touch my Social Security, don't touch my Medicare, don't touch entitlements," they're not going to do that. So it's really, you know, that's what the American people want. That's what they're going to do. But we're spending now more on the interest on the debt than we're paying for the military. We're paying $800 billion for the military. We're paying more on interest on the debt. Why don't you ask Ali these questions? <laughs> I'm going to go to her next. So how do the Democrats deal with this? Oh, well, I think a lot of, and I'm by no means an economist, I am a political strategist, so so bear with me. Um, but I, you know, I think a lot of the plans that we've seen from Democrats do usually have a way to, to, to pay for them, right? We've seen that with infrastructure, we've seen that with a lot of the climate plans. I, I think it's a real issue, we're gonna have to figure it out. But I also, you know, to, to John's point, uh, how, how do we gut Social Security and Medicare? We can't. And you know, I think there's there's little stuff too, right? Like this week, they rolled out free lunches for kids and how many Republican governors rejected it because of you know spend and they weren't ready to implement it yet. But that's, how are you gonna tell kids they can't eat, right? We, we've gotta figure out a way to take care of our people and also take care. Well, that's part of the problem is that yeah. if you keep giving all the money away, then you have no more money. And I think the real issue for us is inflation. When you degrade the, um, the, the currency, which is what we're doing by inflating ourselves, it, it, it actually has an impact on everything that we spend, which is why inflation is completely out of control. Now, I will also say that, you know, the Chinese don't like that either because they hold a lot of our debt. And, and, and so there's gonna be global implications if we don't deal with this. To your point, I just don't see either Trump or Biden taking the point. No, I, well, yeah, go one more point, especially because we're on a college campus. I think, I'm sure sometimes, to, to be honest, and for your reference, I'm, I'm 36, I'm like a true millennial. My eyes glaze over with these conversations because I'm worried about how I'm gonna buy a house. How I'm going to pay my college debt? You want me to worry about the national debt when I can't figure out those issues, and we can't articulate to young people how they're going to, you know, pay for their own things, let alone sixty years from now when they're on Medicaid. So we've, you know, not only got to figure out the actual problem, we've got to figure out a way to articulate this and talk about this in a way that makes it real for young people and voters. But but here's what I get so frustrated with because it's a pox on both parties, presidents of Republican and Democratic persuasion. Congress that continues to spend money that we do not have and not the ability, they keep saying, you know, well, it's percentage of GDP or they keep kicking the can down the road. At some point, we're at the end of the road and I think we're getting there because of the interest payments alone that we're paying. Yeah, you have a good point. And to your, big, your original question about how can Congress not increase taxes by $3.5 trillion? And that's a debate that, that's gonna happen. And will they just decide to allow all these tax increases to happen, and if that happens, what happens to the economy? Can the economy sustain a $3.5 trillion tax increase by the end of 2025? I don't know if they can. I also don't think that the American people will necessarily want to have automatic tax increases, but from a fiscal standpoint, I think it would largely help uh, deal, deal with this. You gotta bring in more money, you gotta cut spending. Questions, who do we have? I thought you had a question. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, there you go. He's the important person. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm a custodian here in Hamilton. 
Uh, I Thank you for that. Nail. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Um, I met Tip O'Neill in 83. That was my eighth grade trip to Washington. He represented my neighborhood. Love Tip O'Neill. Oh, Tip was awesome. I was in the gallery looking at Tip O'Neill, and there's a guy talking in his ear, and there's a guy at the podium, and I said to the nun, I says, how does he hear both conversations? And she said, he's a very smart man. <laughs> but anyway, um, I gladly cast my vote for the first time when I was 20 for Michael S. Dukakis, you know, uh, when I lived in Mass, and he didn't win. And I didn't see anybody take to the streets and say, he's not my president. I looked at HW and I go, all right, I hope he does good. Because if he does good, I do good. Why would I cut my own nose off? So 2016 rolls around. I'm sick of the Bushes. I'm sick of the Clintons. I am, we have 150 years of union membership between my father and my brothers and myself. There was been a Kennedy and the Pope on the wall in my house my entire life. If Ted Kennedy said we needed it, we needed it. Um, and I have never voted red. 2016, I came close. I just wanted to throw a, throw a pan in the mm -hmm. fire, you know what I mean? And I came close, and my father come from the grave, and he's like, don't you even vote red. And I was like, all right, I'm sorry, and I voted <laughs> Hillary. You know? And, and, and Trump won. And I didn't say he's not my president, and, but I saw people take to the streets. He's not my president. And I'm saying, like, I'm sorry. Yes, he is. <laughs> you, you may live in a world where you think he's not, but he actually is. And you are cutting off your nose to spite your face. You talked about the impeachments. Mm -hmm. Imagine what he could have accomplished if Congress worked with him. You had the Abraham Accords. You had the GDP at sure. 3.2. You had inflation at 1.4. It was up to almost 11%. It's down to like 9.3 now, and they say it's shrinking. No, it's just growing slower. So who are you going to vote for in 2024? Oh, Trump all the way. Absolutely. thousand percent. Everybody's saying the sky is going to fall and democracy's over. Well, guess what? He already <laughs> won once and democracy didn't fall. We were in the greatest position ever. Lowest employment for blacks, lowest employment for women, lowest employment, period. Right. And he had the guys North and South Korea shaking hands at the border. Nobody's come close to that in 60 years. Technically, we're still in a conflict with them. So I'm going to have you respond to that. I want to tell you real quick, Chris Matthews, Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan story, just to give you some context on these two Irish politicians. In March of 1981, we all know that Ronald Reagan was assassinated. And a couple of days Not later, assassinated. assassinated attempt. Sorry. Right. Uh, we all know a couple of days later, it was Tip O'Neill who went to George Washington Hospital and prayed at the bedside of Ronald Reagan. And gave him a kiss on the forehead. That gives you a sense of the politics of these two Irish politicians. Exactly. And then you have Nancy Pelosi ripping the speech to uh, Donald Trump. But how do you respond to that? Well, thank and get you. That, get that guy on Fox <laughs> News. Go ahead. No, no, thank you. And I think, you know, I similar picture of the Pope on the wall, big Kennedy family, Union family, get, get the background. I, I would say two things. One, I don't know if anyone here had seen it, but when Barack Obama was president and I was driving through rural Western Pennsylvania, I saw some stuff that said he's not my president and and worse. So I don't think this is a phenomenon that, that started with Trump. I think polarization has definitely, definitely increased. I, I will give you that. But but I, I do think, you know, there there was some common threads with Obama. Um to the point about the world not ending, and we talked a little bit about this before, for for me personally, when Trump got elected, I, I did feel that feeling of the world is ending, specifically on abortion, and specifically on because I knew where the Supreme Court justices, you know, were going to come down on this once, you know, RBG died and everyone else was there. So I think it's a great example of politics is deeply personal, and what one person feels, another person doesn't. Um, I would also say the thing that that really... I was clearly never a Trump fan. I, I worked for Tom Steyer's need to impeach campaign. Uh, you know, I, I was never a fan. January 6th also really, I think, put the nail in that coffin for me, which it, it scared me as to what another Trump presidency could look like. I can't wait to see your dad in heaven and what he says about you voting for Trump and Republican. Let's get another question. Who has it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, hi, uh, so my name is Sylvia. I'm a junior, um, and I guess I'm pretty interested in hearing more about inflation and plans to fight inflation because, uh, you know, I feel like right now the Fed is fighting inflation, which is why we have that 5.5 interest rate, right? Like, if 
any of the candidates' plan is to feed more into the economy, that's not going to fight inflation, right? So I guess it's, so I just want to hear more about like the individual's plan. And, you know, John Thierry, just to pick up on that, John Kennedy once said when it comes to inflation, you know, victory has many fathers, defeat is an orphan. And when it comes to the economy, the president gets blamed. But really, how much does the president bear responsibility to her point? Because the Fed drives a lot of what we're seeing with inflation. And it's it's gone down. It's still high, but it's certainly right. down than it was a year ago. So Milton Friedman, and I'm not an economist, but Milton Friedman did say that inflation is caused by too much money chasing after too few goods. And uh, my, I think there's a couple things that, that should happen. First, we, we need more goods, right? And I think that there's a lot of things that the government is doing right now at, at regulatory standpoints that make it much more difficult for, for more goods to be, be um, created. I think a lot of this green agenda is adding a lot more unnecessary costs. The uh, drive to get rid of fossil fuels has been a disaster for, uh, for gas prices, we, we know that they're coming down a little bit, but they still are not down with where they should be. Um, and we've, we, we've been on a, a spending binge since COVID. Now, it wasn't just Joe Biden, it was also Donald Trump. And I don't know if Trump cares that much about inflation. I, I know if, once he becomes president, he should. Um, and I, I do think that we need the Federal Reserve obviously has a role to play, which they did with uh, Paul Volcker uh, when Ronald Reagan was president. What his solution was, was to briskly increase uh, the, the interest rates and really kind of destroy the economy. Um, and yeah, as a result, um, you had a massive recession and a lot of people lost a lot of livelihoods and it was very, very painful uh, for the, and the Republicans lost, got, got killed in the House and lost the Senate because of 1982. It. 1982. Um, so I don't know if that's the right approach, um, but I do think that the, the one thing that we we should be thinking about is structural reform that 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 values the currency more than it's valued, and because we have a devalued currency right now, and we're kind of hitting kind of Weimar Republic type of stage right now, where you know we have. We're, we're a trillion dollars a year is a, it's almost funny money and that that becomes very dangerous and the other thing about inflation is it it feeds upon itself so people keep raising prices because they feel like they can get away with it and you know what hurts the most is the working class who can't don't don't get these big mm -hmm. big raises i mean they, they're not the the raises are not happening. And a lot of times they're not happening because there's so many regulations on these businesses that make it almost impossible for them to uh, to make, make a profit as it is. But unemployment at a record low level, anyone who wants a job can get a job. Well, record unemployment is also feeds inflation. Right. And so that, because that, but we, you've seen record unemployment, but that's not because there's, there's a lot of people working two or three jobs and um, you know, that also feeds inflation uh, and, and if you have, you know, for example, if you go to Washington, D.C. to out to dinner, you have um, like a minimum wage and then you have a tip thing. And all of a sudden you're spending, you know, forty dollars for something that cost you twenty dollars two years ago. Yeah. And and you don't know what what the hell happened. And most families can't afford that. And the tip started at 30 percent. Right. The tip started at 30 <laughs> percent. Another question. Somebody in the back. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're here all week, so you guys are a great audience. Thank you very much. <laughs> so my name is John. Uh, my question is, what happens if Donald Trump is in jail for the election comes along? What will happen? So we have gone almost an hour without talking about Stormy Daniels, sex and hush money and all the other good things that are going to happen beginning next Monday as they select the jury and three other trials that probably may not happen. But Donald Trump going to jail before the election, that was a question. Well, the theory is that if Trump gets con convicted, um, it'll be bad for his uh, his re-election or his election. Um, re-election, he was elected once, 2016. Um, that's the theory. Electoral right? college, not the and, popular. And I, and I think that that's why um, they're trying to get victim of something because they think it's gonna hurt him in the polls. Uh, I don't know if that's true. And all I know is every time there's been a new prosecution of Donald Trump, this has happened in the Republican primary. His popularity ratings went up 10 points. I think the Democrats are much better off talking about abortion than they are about Donald Trump's legal troubles. Because it's baked in. 
you know what you know about him, right? Yeah, or not? I mean, look, there's people who wear t-shirts with his mug shots on it, right? Like, uh, I think people know who Trump is, and if you like him, you like him, and I don't disagree with that. I think sometimes, even in our very, very jaded, obstructed, polarizing political system that we have now, you simply got to do what's right. He committed a crime, they have to see it through, um, and, and people will do with that what they will. So boys and girls, let's go back to another major scandal 24 years ago that almost cost a Republican candidate the presidency. It was so quaint back then, a DUI charge from 1976 that came up the weekend before the election that almost derailed the Bush campaign. We've gone from that to where we are today with Donald Trump. You know, it's funny, we talked about Chris Matthews and what Matthews wrote in his book, The Hardball, was you, you, hide, uh, you put a lantern on your problems. We know... We know all of Donald Trump's problems. There's no mystery here. There's no mystery to Donald Trump. As you said, it's all baked in. With, with what happened with Bush, it wasn't just the fact that he was DUI. It was what they, they tried to cover it up. And it, it came off exactly the, the wrong time during the campaign. And this is why, you know, we, I, mean, I do think that, you know, when uh, Barack Obama wrote his book and he talked about all the stuff he did, you know, people read the book or some people didn't read it, but it, it, it didn't matter to the voters. And, you know, when Bill Clinton did his thing, you know, what they cared about with Bill Clinton was the economy was going well. And he, and when he, you know, I remember working a little bit on the campaign against Bill Clinton. And I remember we were talking about Vietnam and we were talking about the bimbo eruptions. We were talking about this. You know what Bill Clinton was talking about? It's the economy, stupid. You know why he won? Because it was about the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. So you got to figure out what the messages the voters care about and Quite often, they don't care about all this other stuff. Good point. Another question in the back. Somebody had their hand up. Yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, I just want to say first, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, my question is, I found it interesting that when you guys talked about uh, important issues in the upcoming election and currently, uh, no one talked about climate change. And I was wondering what your views on that and what you think Trump and Biden's views are that for this upcoming election. Good point. A report came out just two days ago from the European Union Climate Agency that we've had for the 10th month in a row, the hottest temperatures on the Earth planet, and it is getting warmer. Donald Trump says it's fake science. You say what? It's it's not fake science, and I think all of you that go to college know that. Uh, I think the Biden administration has done some of the mo its most substantial work uh, on climate. I think it's been... Um, a cornerstone of this admin these last three years. You know, they have a White House office for specifically climate. They're pumping out climate change every day. Just today, they worked with the EPA to um, put restrictions on forever chemicals. The thing about climate change, and this has been a little bit of what we've been talking about, uh, we're, we won't see the effects for a while, even though we have to take action right now. It is the most urgent thing it is top of mind, I think, for so many voters. Um, and it's really, truly just bizarre to me, and I'm sure to many of you, that the Republicans haven't caught on to this yet. I, I think it's a bunch of nonsense. I think that we need to focus on a cleaner fossil fuels and we need a cleaner environment. But I I, I mean, I've been around, I, remember, I was in high, high school when we were talking about how uh, the climate was changing, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna have an ice age. Um, you know, is the planet warming? Yeah, probably. But you know, what we need to focus on we need to focus on cleaner fossil fuels. We, we getting rid of fossil fuels will be a disaster. It'll also be a disaster from the perspective of if we don't have the fertilizer that comes from fossil fuels, we're not going to be able to eat. So I, I, I am a, I am a climate skeptic. I know that that's not a popular opinion here, but that's my strong opinion. And uh, we have a debate going on, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Do you want to respond? I don't. I, I don't know how to respond to it. I think the science is like beyond clear. Um, I, I, you know, we have global conferences dedicated to trying to figure out how to to combat climate change. And I think, you know, the one thing the Biden administration has done and will continue to do, and I think we have to do, is it's baked into everything. It's baked into infrastructure now. It's baked into justice issues now. Um, I, I think it has to be a part of every single conversation that we're having. Yeah, well, I just fundamentally disagree. And I think it's really adding the, an unnecessary cost and making uh, every every cost of every product much more expensive. And um, it's going to be a disaster for our country. And I also think that the Chinese think it's nonsense. And I think that the Indians think it's nonsense. And I think the only people who are really down with that are the Europeans. And they are backing away from that because of what happened in Ukraine. And they are going back to where they need to 
be energy self-sufficient because this is this is an important having energy self-sufficiency is the first point part of having a secure economy in a secure, secure country and if we throw that away shame on us ali how big of a problem is gaza and the middle east for the democrats i think it's it's, it's a problem um it's a real problem i think it's not just with one community i think it's a problem with a bunch of communities i think it's something that's deeply deeply personal for so many people. Um, I think the thing that gives me hope is that you can see that the president is listening. He came out just today that, you know, he's calling for a ceasefire for 68 weeks. He thinks that, you know, the way that Israel is handling this is unacceptable and aid has to get in. Uh, so I, you know, I feel hopeful that the president will keep listening and we'll continue to see some progress. But I understand, and look, we've been in venues. Thank you for your great attendance and participation, but it's very emotional. There have been demonstrations and protests here on this campus and elsewhere, and in states like Michigan, large Palestinian American population. This has got to be a problem for the Democrats. Listen, it's a problem for the world, okay? I mean, Hamas is winning. Hamas, What Hamas wanted by its slaughtering 1,300 innocent people in Israel was for a cleavage between the United States and, and Israel. And that's what's going on. I don't particularly love how Bibi's handled this. I'm not a huge Bibi Netanyahu fan. Um, I think that he's overreacted and he's fallen right, right into what Hamas wanted to do. I think slaughtering innocent people on both sides is atrocious. I wish I would like to see stronger international leadership and I'd like to see stronger relations or leadership from our president, which we're not getting. He's kind of being pushed all over the place. And he's he's reading the political tea leaves instead of going in and saying, okay, we got to fix this problem. We got to stop the slaughter, but we got to make sure that there's, I mean, the, the thing that's most frustrating for me is all those hostages have, have been killed now. And, you know, th there's just not any strong leadership. And I think it's what people are s s feeling. And um, Hamas is winning. This is exactly what they want. They wanted the, the United States to walk away from Israel and they, I think they played everybody like a like a fiddle. And they're not good people. Hamas is not is not good people. I mean, they 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 get themselves in a situation so that we know we, they they know that they're going to bomb somebody, and that innocent people are going to be killed. We know that that's exactly what they're going to do. You know, I am not an expert in 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 the Middle East, but I know what I don't like, and I don't like what's going on. My final question, I'll get one more, two more questions, is what's at stake for the Republicans and for the Democrats in this election? So you can think about that. Another question from the audience. Where is it? Somewhere, I think, in the back, if we had it? No? No more questions. Okay. So, There's one more back. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I thought I saw it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Taylor, and thank you guys for coming. I'm a sophomore here, and I was wondering about the role of social media on this election and the role of social media on foreign interests in this election and how, I guess, as campaigners, you guys are going to use social media and how it's going to affect this election. So, Taylor, where do you go for information? What is your social media diet like? Like what apps do I use? I use yeah. social media, but mostly probably Instagram. Instagram, that's so interesting. So you're not a TikTok person. No, I, I've never been a TikTok person myself. So I'm going to tell you something about TikTok. My um, Congress moved to ban TikTok. My 11-year-old daughter said, you know, the head of TikTok's not from China. He's from Singapore. This is my 11-year-old. Um, TikTok is extremely powerful, extremely effective um, device. And I don't know how you get rid of it. Now, Ron DeSantis in Florida uh, decided that Kids under the age of 14 should not get access to any social media. And I can't tell you how many liberal Washington Post reporters and others who have small children love that idea, even though they hate Ron DeSantis. So if you're a parent, as I got, I am at 11, you're like, geez, what do you do with this stuff? Because it is completely addictive, but it's also, you know, hard to stop. And to the point on, on foreign interests manipulating, I think they're doing that. I think all of our enemies are playing in, in that space. I think they're pitting against each other. Anytime I see a bot, um, and I don't think they're doing it necessarily for any one candidate. You can make the argument that they're doing it for Trump, then maybe they are. But I think they're mostly doing it to have Americans go against each other and divide and weaken America. And I, I'm a huge proponent and a absolute believer in free speech. Uh, and I'm, I'm someone who doesn't really love the idea of censoring anything. 
And that became that became even more of my point during during COVID when I thought, you know, when they were going after people who had a different opinion on COVID, they were literally trying to throw them in jail. Um, but this is an issue that requires a lot of communication, a lot of parenting, and a little bit more sophistication from the voters who who populate that space to understand that don't fall for the traps of people, you know, setting up. So anytime I see what I think is a bot on Twitter, I, I try to identify, hey, this is probably a bot. And by the way, you should follow me on Twitter because I got a great Twitter feed. It's now X. <laughs> it's now X. Thank I you. call it Twitter. I'll be Twitter to me. That's okay. <laughs> so, so to bring it back a little more tactical, because this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about, and you both will probably remember this, uh, back in 2010, 2012, before that, a little bit after that, you had different departments on a campaign. You had the press shop, you had the digital communication shop, you had you know, other other kind of branches. Now communications is is digital, right? We have to think about it all as one. We can't just be thinking that earned media means more than social media or social media means more than earned media because they're all one, right? Uh, earned media pops up on your TikTok feed and you're watching your TikTok feed and it's just as powerful as, as earned media. Um, that being said, to, to your point, I, I think we all have to think about it as a tool. I think TikTok was kind of the perfect storm during the pandemic because so many people were lonely and you looked on there and you saw people that looked like you and you felt a little bit of comfort. I, full disclosure, love TikTok. Sometimes I fall asleep and I wake up because my phone hits my face because I've been scrolling. Um, but what? I, yeah, <laughs> pretty bad. Um, I think you know, the the way that the campaign should be thinking about it and is thinking about it is everyday people talking about their experiences. And, you know, nothing is more powerful than storytelling. And TikTok is essentially a tool for, for storytelling. So is, you know, Instagram Reels and Instagram as a whole. But the more we can just get people out there sharing their stories, why they're voting, who they're voting for that are just normal, plain people, not any of the three of us, the, the better and the stronger the campaign can be. So Aliyah and John, I cannot thank you enough for spending the day here on the campus and for being with these great students and joining us tonight. And I want to give you each a minute to talk about what it means for the Republicans or the Democrats, what's at stake in this campaign, the Biden-Trump rematch that nobody wants, but it's what we have. So Aliyah, we'll begin with you on the Democratic side. What is at stake? Before the Democratic side, Side, I will say to take this super big picture, what's at stake, period, is, is trust in our institutions, right? No matter who wins, I think we're at a place in our politics. We've talked a lot about division and uh, polarization and where the media is and where people are. And I think especially post-COVID, uh, trust in, in government and in the media is at an all-time low. So whoever wins, that needs to be top of mind. We've, we've got to do something to, to bring this country together a little bit. What's at stake for, for I think, the country, if, if Democrats don't win, um, we've talked about this whole time, it's reproductive freedom, it is climate, it is, I think, what is a vision for the future that uh, shows growth and progress and doesn't take us back uh, in time, which has been Donald Trump's message all along. He wants to, you know, that's what make, make America great again, is to, to bring us back to a time where uh, certain people didn't have the protections and the freedoms that, that they do today. So I think you said it the best when you talked about us having a Republican House and Senate and president, and then what happens with the Supreme Court. That's that's what's at stake. It is what we saw happen with Roe times infinity with every issue you can think of. John, we'll give you the last word. Oh, good, the last word. Um, listen, I think- Thank you, you very much. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I think right now what's at stake and I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. And I, I don't think that the, the world's going to end no matter who is the president. I think that, that the, the, the Congress and, the, and the, the president will find some ways to keep things going. I think if Republicans have the control of the House and the Senate, they will find a way to get this economy going again. I think they'll find a way to get an inflation to come down. I think they'll make do things effectively to lower the price of most goods. I think they'll try to find a way to to show strong American leadership that doesn't get us in any more wars. I think they'll offer a, a competitive and spirited uh, effort to um, deal with China. Um, and I think that you'll see, um, for two years, you'll see the Congress effectively doing a lot of things that the people in middle America want done. Return manufacturing in the United States, return uh, jobs in the United States, but more importantly, 
get get control of the high price of products, which are just driving people crazy. And uh, I do think they bring some sanity back to our, our, our policy making because we need some more sanity and less kind of this crazy woke insanity that is really all over the place and drives me crazy. Uh, I see. So I think that you'll 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 see a return to sanity, and that's a good thing. Um, and then I think in two years you'll have uh, the, the Democrats take back the House, and then you'll have you know a new president two years after that, and life will go on, and uh, America will be great again. You have been a great audience. Thank you to all of you, Ty. Thank you for having us here tonight. To the students at Hamilton College, uh, a few more weeks before summer break. Thank you to Aaliyah and John for coming up to Clinton, New York. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.